Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining uh, AIDS Watch 2020 this year. Uh, I first of all want to give you uh, a warm welcome from uh, our partners uh, here uh, at AIDS Watch. Uh, the co-sponsors this year of the AIDS Watch 2020 are AIDS United, the Treatment Ac Access Expansion Project, as well as the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. Once again, thank you so much for joining. I can see a number of you uh, in the chat function uh, saying good morning from all the places that you are. Uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Kenyon Farrow. I'm the senior editor at the Body. Uh, and today I will be serving as the A's Watch virtual moderator. Uh, so just a couple of things that uh, I wanna say before we officially get started this morning. First of all, um, I just wanna say, uh, that uh, you can, of course, you know, interact with each other through the uh, Zoom webinar chat function. I see, again, lots of you um, talking to each other that way. When we get to uh, sort of Q&A from presentations, uh, you will also see a, a Q&A box uh, where you can ask questions there. I will say up front that the questions for um, our federal partners uh, who will be presenting. Um, we will collect those questions um, first and uh, they will respond to those questions, of course, at a later time. Uh, secondly, I want to say um, thank you uh, all for joining and that I hope uh, that you're all maintaining your appropriate social distance, that you're washing your hands, and that you're um, feel supported in this time of uh, the coronavirus pandemic that uh, is the reason why we are virtual today. Um, but I wanna thank you for uh, your participation. Um, so uh, those are just uh, a few notes for me. Uh, last thing I wanna mention um, before we get started is social media. So because we aren't going to be visiting our you know, representatives in Congress this year, um, we have the power of social media to make our voices heard by policymakers. So first and foremost, if you are going to use any social media, want to tweet about this meeting, any of the presentations or the breakout sessions this afternoon, please use uh, the hashtag uh, AIDSWatch on all your posts to keep the conversation going and we'll be sure to share your content all day long. This, of course, also applies to uh, the virtual uh, sort of hill visits that you'll have where you can actually uh, send messages uh, to your direct uh, representatives in Congress, some of which uh, some sample uh, options you should have received uh, in your packet uh, earlier uh, or late last week. Um, so once again, I just want to say uh, thank you to you all for attending. Um, thank you to the uh, uh, the organizations who organize uh, AIDS Watch, it's AIDS United Treatment Access Expansion Project and the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. Uh, and next, uh, I just want to uh, turn the morning over uh, to welcome you all uh, to uh, Jesse Mylon, who is the president and CEO of uh, AIDS United. So I will turn it over to Jesse. One second, everyone. Good morning. 
My name, my name is Jesse Mylan, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this first ever virtual AIDS Watch. There you go. Good morning, and welcome to this first ever virtual AIDS Watch. My name is Jesse Mylan. I'm the president and CEO at AIDS United, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here. You know, we at AIDS United never expected that we would be hosting a virtual AIDS Watch, but so much dire and unexpected has happened to all of us because of COVID-19. So before we get started, we wanna send all of our thoughts and our prayers to all those who are getting sick, and dying from COVID-19. And we want to send our support to all of our public health, our public health colleagues, and to all those healthcare professionals who are working so hard to stop and treat this virus. We thank every single one of them. And thank you to all of you for committing to this virtual AIDS Watch. Thank you for connecting with your colleagues from all across the country. Some 650 of you connecting today to keep our advocacy movement going forward. And, you know, we've been connecting for nearly 40 years. And through connecting, we've been creating unity. And out of our unity, we have become experts. We are experts on how to address a virus that's transmittable. We are experts on how to translate science into social change. And we are experts on how to advocate for the public health resources that we need. And that's what we're going to continue doing. And though we may be physically distant from each other today, we are social, socially connected. And that social connection has continued. We've been intentional about connecting across cities and across states and across rural communities. We've been intentional about connecting across generations and across genders, across races and ethnicities, across orientations and identities, and we've been intentional about connecting across political parties and even personal faiths. And over these next few months, we're going to continue connecting with Congress to tell them not only our stories, but to tell them what we need for ending this epidemic. And that what we need for ending this epidemic includes not only what we need right now in the midst of the coronavirus, but what we need for all of us who are aging with HIV. And that includes each and every one of us living with HIV because we're aging every minute. It includes everything we need to stop all transmissions, to stop all new illness and death, and what we need to stop and end for once and for all, all the stigma, all the discrimination, the criminalization, and the trauma again, from, from HIV, and HIV and AIDS. And, you know, we are experts at taking care of our community, at taking care of our sick and dying. We are experts at addressing this epidemic. And I'm so pleased that all of you are here. I want to thank you for your work and your role every day on ending the epidemic. And I'd like to introduce our partners for producing AIDS Watch every year the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, and the Treatment Access Expansion Project. First to Sophia Cass from the Caucus, and then to Robert Greenwald from Tate. Sophia, over to you. Thank you, Jesse. And good morning, everyone. My name is Sophia Cass. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the Positively Trans Program Coordinator at the Transgender Law Center. And um, I have the privilege to represent the um, caucus of people living with um, HIV and AIDS in the United States in welcoming you all to this um, virtual 2020 AIDS Watch. Just this morning, we received the sad news that our dear sister and comrade Lorena Borjas has transitioned. Lorena 
Today, I speak in memory of your passion and your love, your, com your fierce commitment to what HIV and AIDS advocacy is all about. May you rest in power with our ancestors. We will continue the fight in her honor. In this moment, the stakes are really high for people living with HIV and AIDS in the United States. They are particularly so for our most marginalized and often overlooked communities. People of color, women, black people, people of trans experience, sex workers, immigrants, people in prisons and detention cages, people with disabilities, people with substance use, southerners, people living in rural areas, and people who are experiencing homelessness, mental health challenges, or isolation. On one hand, this novel coronavirus has exposed and amplified the systemic inequalities and all the isms that we already knew were there and that were impacting and are impacting our social determinants of health, therefore determining our physical and emotional well-being or lack thereof. On the other hand, COVID-19 has made it even more relevant and more urgent the need for an HIV and AIDS movement that strategically and meaningfully involves our marginalized communities living with HIV and AIDS. In the face of COVID-19, our trans communities of color living with HIV are showing exceptional resilience, exceptional resourcefulness, generosity, passion, and leadership. Black and brown trans leaders are once again leading from the front lines and putting their lives at risk to keep our people alive, fed, sheltered, and safe. And may I add, they are doing so with little to no resources. In the words of my fellow TLC colleague and community leader, Mariah Moore, I quote, we're doing what we've always done, which is to hold each other down, but it's getting unbearable. We shouldn't need a pandemic for people to give us resources, end quote. For me personally, AIDS Watch has always been about us coming together to keep each other and our elected officials accountable to the collective needs of all of our HIV and AIDS communities. This time, I call on all of us to lift up the unique experiences and the unique legal policy and funding needs of our most vulnerable communities. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you everyone again. Thank you. And so we'll move uh, next to uh, Robert Greenwald. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Treatment Access Expansion Project, I welcome you all to this year's 27th Annual AIDS Watch. I want to start by expressing my hope that you are settled into a place that at least addresses your essential needs and that you're connected to people who provide you with support and friendship at this difficult time. It's hard to believe how much our lives have changed over the past eight weeks. It wasn't until January 30th that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern. Tragically, President Trump didn't follow this lead, and it wasn't until March 13th that he issued emergency declarations which finally unleashed a set of activities that are now slowly being implemented here in the United States to help address the needs created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet still, this administration continues to deny the seriousness of this pandemic, and this threatens our lives now more than ever. This must stop, 
along with reversing the damaging laws and policies this administration has implemented <clears throat> over the past three years. This is a primary message we need to deliver to our Congress, the administration, and our state elected officials. We all, as a movement, have been participating in AIDS Watch for 27 years in an effort to stop a virus and end a pandemic. We know what is needed to stop viral pandemics, and we need our members of Congress to listen to us as we remind and educate them of the lessons learned in the fight to eradicate HIV. Most important, ending pandemics requires investment in policies, in programs that expand evidence-based responses, promoting science over politics. Investment is essential, and the recent rounds of congressional funding are helpful, but they're only a start of what is needed. Congress must increase financial investments in research for both cures and vaccines. Congress must adequately fund our safety net programs that address our essential health and social service needs, from Medicaid and Medicare to Ryan White and Hopwa, from SNAP and WIC to Social Security and unemployment insurance. Notably, the Affordable Care Act is the largest recent expansion to our safety net in 50 years. And just when we need it most, 18 Republican state attorneys general and the Trump administration are asking the Supreme Court to strike it down. Again, lives are on the line as the Affordable Care Act's subsidized private health plans and Medicaid expansion ensure over 22 million people. The Affordable Care Act also offers the best options for millions of Americans who have recently lost their employer-sponsored coverage or are otherwise uninsured. While we must insist that the Trump administration and the state attorneys general drop this case, Congress should immediately enact legislation that secures the future of the Affordable Care Act, including additional incentives to get states that have failed to adopt Medicaid expansion to do it now. We must let Congress know that no one in this country is prepared for the health and economic consequences of repeal of the Affordable Care Act or for a lack of strong support for all of our safety net programs. Now, more than ever, we need sound evidence-based laws and policies that protect and promote human rights and public health. The list is long, but let me name a few examples of where Congress must act. Congress must immedi immediately enact a law that overturns the administration's public charge rule, ensuring that immigrants living in the United States are free to seek health care. Congress must enact a law that guarantees that LGBTQ plus communities are covered by non-discrimination protections, securing basic rights to health care, housing, and employment. Congress must reform our criminal justice systems, eliminating unreasonable criminalization and sentencing laws. And Congress must enact a law that protects access to sexual and reproductive health care, reversing efforts to block access to these essential services. These and other laws promote public health. They're evidence-based. We must insist with our members of Congress that these laws are enacted to secure human rights and a sound government response to pandemics. Finally, it's clear that this year's AIDS Watch is different from any other we have ever hosted, but many things remain unchanged. We have to continue to make strong connections with our members of Congress and their staff. With those members of Congress who support us, we must thank them and urge them to do more. With those members who oppose us, we must continue to do what we've done for over 27 years and that is to respectfully yet forcefully help them to see the implications of their actions and understand what sound laws look like. Let's remain vigilant and get the majority of members in the House and the Senate to support our policy asks. Let's achieve this immediate goal as we work to secure our ultimate goal, which is to have a different president and a clear majority in both the House and the Senate that truly supports science and evidence-based policies over politics. You are the key to AIDS Watch success. Now more than ever, we need to tell our stories, be relentless, rock Congress. 
this administration and our state elected officials. Be well and thank you so much for participating in AIDS Watch 2020. It is the largest AIDS Watch we've ever had. Let's be sure to tell our stories and make sure that our members of Congress, this administration, and our state officials hear what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Sophia. And thank the uh, pe person living, people living with HIV caucus and tape for your continued collaboration with AIDS United. This morning, we'd also like to say a thank you to all of our sponsors. We especially thank the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, our only diamond level sponsor, and for their continued support over the years. And we want to thank our returning sponsors and all of our new sponsors this year for sticking with us as we transitioned on a very short notice, age, uh, uh, AIDS Watch from a uh, in-person meeting to a virtual meeting. You all rock and we can't thank you enough for sticking by us. And now I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker for the morning, Dr. Jonathan Merman. Certainly the coronavirus is on everyone's minds and it's been impacting not only us on a personal level, but all of our programs and all of our organizations. And that's why we've invited Dr. Merman to join us this morning. Dr. Merman is the director at the CDC of the Center on HIV, Viral Hepatitis, STDs, and TB Prevention. And we asked him if he could join us today and he's taking time out of a very busy, busy schedule as he addresses the coronavirus for all of us. Dr. Merman is a Rear Admiral in the U.S. Public Health Corps. Before that, he was Director of the uh, Division of HIV Prevention at the CDC, also known as DHAP. And he knows a thing or two about pandemics because he served as Director for the CDC of Kenya and also as a Public Health Attaché in Uganda. He's a graduate of Harvard and the Stanford Medical Schools, which should be enough for all of us to appreciate his expertise. But we who know him and love him refer to him as Jono. I can tell you that when I called Jono about a week ago and asked him if he would speak to us about what the HIV community needs to know about coronavirus, he got back to me in literally one minute. And he said, Jesse, I really want to do this. So speaking to us from his home in Atlanta, please welcome Dr. Jonathan Merman. Jono, over to you. Thank you very much, Jesse and, um, and uh, Kenyon uh, Farrell for inviting me uh, to talk about coronavirus and HIV. Um, we're in an unprecedented time in the country and the world right now, um, as people have already talked about this morning. And I've been thinking about our HIV community as we navigate COVID-19 in what's an uncertain landscape uh, for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, and for our community. People with HIV understand stigma and discrimination. And people with HIV understand the results of inaction. People with HIV also understand what happens when we are all included, what it means to be embraced by family, friends, strangers and healthcare workers. And we know what happens when we act thoughtfully and positively leading with science, love and support. So I wanted to start this talk with some background and the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic and then discuss some specific issues for people with HIV, including some frequent questions that people have asked me over the past few weeks. Um, and so I'm going to share, um, can you share my Slides. I think I may need you to do that, Kenyon or Jesse. Uh, yeah, if they're shared, just tell me when to advance them. Thanks. Perfect. So, um, can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, there are many coronaviruses um, that have been found mostly in bats, but there are seven now that have affected humans. And I really wanted to mention this just because there are four. That, that, um, that essentially cause mostly symptoms of cold. And um, so they, they are uh, transmittable, um, but they are low in pathogenicity. People don't get very sick with them. 
but there are now three that, have, that can cause severe illness. Um, two are SARS and MERS, which have caused um, very severe illness um, and outbreaks in the past uh, 20 years. And then more recently, what um, has the unfortunate name of SARS-CoV-2, which causes uh, COVID-19. And, and what's unfortunate about, particularly about um, SARS-CoV-2 is that it both is highly transmittable and it can cause severe disease. Next slide, please. So, so this map um, just shows that, that uh, COVID-19 has affected most of the world, um, although it's, uh, its severity and the magnitude of the number of people that have gotten um, SARS-CoV-2 is different in different countries. It is spreading throughout um, the entire globe, and that's um, why it's been called a pandemic. Um, and what we are seeing is that um, there's, uh, there's no place that is essentially immune from the virus, similar to what we've experienced with HIV in the past, um, is that you have to address it head on. Um, you can't hide from this virus either. Next slide, please. So this is um, just showing the number of new COVID-19 cases in the United States. What we started to see in the beginning of this year is a few cases, and now what we're seeing is an exponential increase, really striking many different parts of the, of the country all at the same time um, with uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of cases in just the past few days. Next slide, please. And this map um, just shows um, the, uh, the, the kind of the relative increase in the rate of these infections per population in different parts of the country. And so you can kind of see where it's increasing most in the past few days. And what we're seeing is in the Northeast and in the Southwest and Northwest, there's some um, particular areas of increase, but you're also seeing spaces throughout the country that you might not have thought about, counties that are seeing increases in COVID-19. Um, because it is spreading to many different communities. And um, because its incubation period is a median of five to six days, it spreads before we, people become symptomatic. And then, um, and then we, uh, if we wait to put in precautions until um, we've noted it, um, that people have um, illness and are diagnosed with COVID-19, essentially you're waiting too late. Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight here that, that there seems to be um, kind of two factors with severe disease. One is underlying illnesses and people with underlying illnesses related to either immune suppression or um, pulmonary disease or diabetes um, or other things are particularly susceptible when they, um, when they get SARS-CoV-2 to have severe disease, um, but also age. Age seems almost independently to be associated with severe disease. And you can see here, um, in, the, in the table on the left, that it really starts to see an increase starting at about age 55 of, of, of a doubling of, um, of uh, mortality rates, which then goes up quite um, uh, rapidly in terms of severity um, up until over the age of 85. And, and this, um, which we can talk about later, is really an important issue for people with HIV, primarily because about half of people with HIV in the country are over the age of 50. And, and so um, the potential if one does get SARS-CoV-2 to have severe diseases higher than for others. And so taking um, preventive measures is particularly important. Next slide, please. Um, another question um, that people have often asked is, is, you know, who is able to actually transmit um, SARS-CoV-2? Is, um, is it, do I have to be ill to be able to do it? What we're finding is that um, in the left is, a, is, a, is a, actually a, a graph that shows that as you get older um, and you have the virus, you're actually, you have higher uh, amounts of the virus in your oral secretions. And this is a log curve, so it's really a 10 to, to 100 fold increase as one gets older. Um, but at the same time, um, we've detected virus um, in oral nasal secretions from people who are asymptomatic, people who are pre-symptomatic, meaning that the 
you know, a, a day to, to three days before they become, become ill. People are mildly symptomatic, and then people are very ill. Um, and, and epidemiologically, there's an increasing evidence of a role for asymptomatic transmission to actually be um, uh, spreading the virus um, in, in communities. Next slide, please. So this is where the, the concept essentially of, of, of flattening the curve, and I've added shrinking the curve because flattening the curve we can, means we delay the onset of illness so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system, but also we, we can shrink the curve, meaning we can have fewer people who actually become ill. And, and, and that's part of the goal of what we would like to do over the next few months is, is have as few people get sick as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and that um, allows us uh, to prevent the spread of the infection, but also to, um, to potentially develop treatments or a vaccine. Next slide, please. So primarily what we have right now are non-pharmaceutical interventions and they work. Um, you can do things like by staying at home. They can, we have had school closures um, in, in every state in, in the nation. Um, people are teleworking as we are for AIDS Watch and then people are avoiding gatherings. And all of these have been shown to be quite effective, especially together in, in, um, in different countries and in cities in the United States. Next slide, please. And this map just um, shows as of uh, last week, um, states and uh, tribal and local areas where um, there have been um, uh, regulations and recommendations for, um, for staying at, at home. And um, that's increasingly the case throughout the country. And it's aligned with the, uh, the recommendation that we have um, restrictions for the next month to attempt to both um, flatten and shrink the curve. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, to really highlight that social distancing policies they, saves lives and money. Um, uh, there are different models, um, but for the US projected benefits of moderate social distancing for seven months in one model um, from the University of Chicago saved about 1.7 million lives in the United States and showed that you actually saved money um, at the same time that you saved lives. Um, on the right, a New York Times um, uh, hired some uh, uh, modelers to, to do a similar um, analysis and showed that um, compared to social distance for 14 days, if you social distance for two months, you can see that the curve is dramatically decreased. It's flattened and it's shrunk. Um, and we do have countries that have implemented these kind of policies um, both before um, the virus took hold and were able to prevent it from spreading um, uh, in communities in their country, but also a country like China, which had um, a massive outbreak in a, um, both a city and a province, but was able to control it after that. Next slide, please. Um, so potentially there would be large benefits to effective treatment and a vaccine. And I think many of us in the scientific community are hopeful that, um, that both will be available um, in the future. Um, theoretically, an effective treatment could prevent severe illness by treating people early on, could reduce transmission because it would um, uh, prevent, lower the viral load. And, it, and also it can be used for potentially for prophylaxis. So pe if people are exposed or potentially exposed um, it would prevent a person from actually getting infected with a virus. Um, in terms of uh, treatments, um, one that has been used in several different countries is convalescent plasma. Um, people who have been infected with the virus um, and recover, um, their um, antibodies have been used um, in other people who are sick with um, COVID-19. And um, there seem to be some preliminary indications that people improve um, with that treatment. And there are ongoing studies right now. Um, there are also new and existing drugs that are, uh, well, that are being evaluated. One is um, certain antiretroviral therapies, which I'll talk about later. Um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, which are uh, drugs either used for malaria or um, for some um, 
connective tissue diseases. Actually, it um, seems also in some trials, if you can go back at it, it seems also to be um, a, a potentially effective, and those are ongoing. Remdesivir is a, a drug that was initially developed for Ebola, um, and, um, but also seems to have in, um, in the laboratory some efficacy against um, coronaviruses is also being evaluated. And then some kind of anti-inflammatory agents that work against the immune reaction that seems to cause some of the problems um, associated with, um, with the, uh, the virus itself. And then lastly, vaccines. There, I think people know there are many different companies that are working on vaccines right now. Um, and um, they are probably going to take longer to develop and, um, and test than some of the treatments, um, but they would be a important um, public health benefit. Next slide. So some of the questions that people with HIV have asked is, are, are, are people with HIV at higher risk for infection or getting severe COVID-19 um, disease than other people? And, and I think the answer is, we don't know now um, because the data aren't in yet, um, but um, theoretically, if someone is immunosuppressed, there are some associations with having more severe COVID-19 disease. So if um, someone has a low CD4 count, um, they could potentially be more at risk for severe disease. Um, at the same time, if it turns out that some of the um, medications um, that are used for HIV actually are effective in um, preventing infection, then one could see them as maybe being beneficial too, but, but that hasn't been shown yet. Um, so I think we don't know the answer, but it would be prudent to take extra precautions as we would be recommending for people who um, are older or have other kind of underlying diseases. Um, what can people do with HIV? I mean, people with HIV do for protection. I think the same measures that we would recommend for others um, um, uh, seem to be effective. And uh, as people know, it is a respiratory spread virus. So keeping distance of at least six feet from others can be helpful. Um, but also uh, washing hands frequently um, it has also been shown to work for, for other viruses similar to coronaviruses. And, and I think in, in general, what our community is doing also benefits people with HIV. And, and, and we as a, as a community in itself can also look after each other. So can HIV medicines or antiretroviral therapy treat COVID-19 or prevent infection? That really isn't known yet. Um, there's some evidence in laboratory evaluations that some of the medications we use can be beneficial. There was one um, randomized study that was just published that looked at um, lopinavir ritonavir. Um, it did not seem to indicate efficacy in that study. It was small numbers and people are still um, evaluating both that uh, combination therapy as well as others to see if it's effective. But right now there would be no recommendation to change your antiretroviral therapy, um, hoping that it might be effective or not. Um, but we do hope um, that uh, some of these might be beneficial or other medicine um, will, come at, will be, prove itself to help people with HIV avoid um, avoid infection with coronaviruses um, or help anyone else if because these drugs have been shown to be unsafe. And then are there any shortages of uh, ART or PrEP that might be expected? And up to this point, no. no one, uh, the FDA has not reported any shortages of these medications, um, but is keeping an eye out for them um, because uh, it would be problematic if that occurred. And there are already um, companies are aware of the potential and the need to ensure that there's an adequate supply. Next slide, please. So what are our kind of specific recommendations for people with HIV? One is really just to make sure you have an ample medication supply, ideally 90 days. I think initially we were thinking 30 days, but really the time for staying at home and avoiding healthcare settings as much as possible um, really um, is longer than we had uh, initially thought. And, and I think it's important important that people somehow arrange to have um, a long-standing supply of medication just in case um, their need to avoid going to a pharmacy or a clinic um, uh, for um, more than a month. Um, the second would be to, um, hoping that vaccinations are up to date and if you do go to a clinic to make sure that, the, um, that you are vaccinated. Um, uh, can you go back one slide please? Thanks. Um, the other is to establish a plan for clinical care. If you find that you are either quarantined, meaning that you um, potentially were exposed but are not ill or isolated because you actually are ill with COVID-19 and you want to avoid 
um, uh, contact with others. Um, telemedicine is, is increasingly being used by clinicians and patients um, and really has found it to be uh, quite useful. Um, and then many physicians who had previously avoided online um, communication, sometimes because of insurance issues, are now finding that insurance companies are more willing to cover um, connecting with patients through online portals and either through you know, email or direct um, video. Um, the other is to really think about your social network. And this was raised by others in the beginning of, of, of AIDS Watch is really that we want to maintain a social network and, and socialize distantly, um, really learn how to connect with people, um, uh, ideally um, uh, as frequently as we would um, it, when we were actually seeing people directly, um, because it's really important to maintain those connections. Um, and then um, lastly, just with healthcare providers, um, thinking about weighing the risks and benefits of attending or not attending a clinic or a hospital visit. Um, if you're sick, you do need to go into the clinic, but it's best um, if you're not to avoid um, going into those settings. Next slide, please. So um, there are places to get guidance for people with HIV. We are continually updating it. Um, our center's particularly interested in making sure that that we do that. Um, so CDC both has um, a, a website um, where we have information what people with HIV should know, particularly about coronavirus. And then NIH's um, uh, led uh, guideline panels also put out interim guidance um, and they'll be updating that as well. Next slide, please. Right, so I've put here just some, some uh, web pages that you can go to for more information. The first one is essentially CDC's coronavirus um, webpage, which has a lot of different links, both for um, individuals and, and practitioners. Um, we also have CDC info where you can actually send in email questions or call. And then the last thing here is just a coronavirus self-checker tool. It's essentially a, a bot that you can put in symptoms or, or, or other aspects of your situation and it could tell you, give you some information based on that about what you might wanna do. Um, and so I just wanted to say that, that I believe, you know, we at CDC, are charged with protecting the nation's health. And, and that's challenging at this time. Um, we don't have the answer to every question, um, but we have confronted large problems together in the past and we have overcome them. And, and please know that wherever you are in this virtual world, uh, we are with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jono, and thank you so much for all you're doing uh, to address the uh, coronavirus pandemic on all of our behalf. There will be an opportunity for you to send questions directly through the chat. Those questions are going to be collected so that we can share them with Dr. Merman and get responses back to you. He has to leave us uh, right now to go further to uh, work and address this immediate crisis. So Jono, thank you so much. And Kenyon, any additional information we should know about collecting questions for Dr. Merman? I look forward to receiving them. And, um, and I really appreciate that people are willing to participate in AIDS Watch and that, in fact, this is larger than ever before. Um, you know, HIV is um, important to all of us. And, um, uh, I think there's a lot that we've learned from our experiences um, that, um, that can help us in this time of COVID-19 as well. And Jono, I want to confirm you're going to make your slides available to us to share with everyone today? Yes, sir. And one last question that we have received on the chat that I'd like to ask you before you go, are there any known cases of people being diagnosed with corona who also have HIV? No, so we're collecting that information. Um, there. The, we do know that there's some people with immunosuppression who have also um, had uh, COVID-19. We don't know if it's HIV or not in the, the initial records that we've looked at, but there is interest in looking more carefully at this. And, um, and I do believe in the next few weeks, we'll be able to get some information um, about that, including whether the, um, the disease is more severe or not. Excellent, thank you. And please keep us updated as you continue to work on addressing this virus and anything we need to know with regard to people living with HIV. Thank you, Jono. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Well, we knew that Jono would respond and he did, and we appreciate all that he's done. 
And we also have other friends who we can rely on. And one of those is Mr. Harold Phillips. We've asked Harold to speak to us about the Ending the Epidemic initiative at the federal government. Harold is at the highest level of, of the Department of Health and Human Services, where he's a senior health advisor for the Office of HIV and Infectious Disease Policy. And in that role, he's been assigned to be the chief operating officer for the Ending the HIV Epidemic. Harold, before that, was at the HIV AIDS Bureau at HRSA, where he was the director of the training capacity building. And I think that's where so many of us came to know him. And before that, he was deputy director of the Ryan White Part B program and the ADAP program. He served on the CDC and HRSA advisory committee himself. And he has a master's in public, uh, in, in uh, urban planning from UNC. But mostly, Harold is also a black gay man who's working hard on addressing the, any of the epidemic plan and coordinating all of the federal agencies across HHS, including CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, and NIH. Harold's a great friend, and we're glad that he's gonna be here to talk to us about what we need to know about the Ending the Epidemic Initiative. Harold, over to you. Thank you, Jesse, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you also to the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, the Treatment Access Expansion Project, and of course, all the staff at AIDS United, and congratulations on having the largest uh, AIDS watch uh, that we've had to date. Uh, we know that this is um, an extraordinary time, uh, but before I go on, I'd also like to do a special thank you to all of you, both the advocates, those who've been on the front line, our healthcare workers, I think over our infectious disease doctors, I, I think over these last couple of weeks, I've come to even grow in appreciation and watch the world grow in appreciation as they've learned from our community about the issues of public health. Never before have I had so many conversations about what all of this means with family and friends who now have a greater understanding of what we have known and, and what we have experienced in fighting the HIV epidemic, the concepts of public health, how folks have stepped forward and both become contact tracers for COVID-19, um, our health department partners who have stepped forward in new and different ways as well, um, and the concern and both the resiliency of our frontline providers to respond to COVID-19, but also keep in the forefront the needs and concerns of people living with HIV. So I commend you all. I hope you are staying safe and well, that you're taking care of yourselves, as well as um, the work that you do uh, to take care of our community. Um, so this morning, I'm gonna talk a little bit, um, and Kenyon, if we could go to the first slide, which is the overview. I'm gonna talk about COVID-19. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative and, and how we uh, plan to move forward. Kenyon, should I do a share screen to be able to do this? Uh oh Yes, you should share, uh, share from your screen. Oh, Lord have mercy. Okay. <laughs> um, so I will keep talking while I try to uh, multitask and pull that up. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> In talking about sort of EHE and our overall progress, uh, I will I will be um, doing that um, and recognize that everything that I am uh, saying also relies on information that I knew <laughs> as of last week. Um, this continues to uh, evolve, uh, evolve. Um, but we have had a series of meetings, both virtually uh, and as a team, to, to continue our work forward, to also think about uh, how we will continue to uh, move the initiative forward. 
uh, as well as what's the right pace, uh, and also keeping in, in mind what's happening on the front line uh, as we in, um, in Washington continue our work as well. I'll give you uh, some updates on our jump starts, uh, the, the three cities that received initial uh, funding. Uh, and I'll also talk about some of the things that we're learning as a result of working with those cities as well. I'll talk about the PACE program, uh, the Ready, Set, Prep program, which is our HHS program, uh, providing PrEP to those who, are, who lack insurance drug coverage. I'll talk about the uh, dashboard and upcoming funding and some of the forward progress that we've been making uh, as a department uh, in working with other agencies as well. My office, the Office of in Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy is also responsible for uh, the HIV.gov website, which many of you are familiar with. Um, Dr. Merman presented some great information about uh, coronavirus uh, and where we are. HIV.gov is also a resource for you all to go to to receive additional information uh, and updates. Uh, as of last week, we put the NIH interim guidance for people living with HIV on the website. We also link to CDC resources, uh, COVID-19 and what people with HIV should know. Last week, also uh, HRSA, the Health Resource Services Administration, also produced uh, an FAQ for Ryan White providers, recipients, subrecipients, and stakeholders. We will continue to update the HIV.gov website uh, moving forward. I think the federal agencies have stepped forward in a number of ways in response uh, to COVID-19 uh, and will continue to look for other ways that we can be most, to help, most effective and use uh, what the levers that we have to really and truly help make a difference and make things easier for those uh, to address this epidemic. Uh, the guidance that was released on telehealth from both HRSA and CMS are an example of this. Also, um, CMS's expanded Medicare coverage for telehealth. Uh, and I think that as we sort of move forward, we will see um, that there will be some long lasting impacts uh, from this as well that will impact both healthcare delivery services and the way we look at uh, healthcare access in this country as well. Um, also, the Office of Civil Rights and OIG have provided some additional uh, flexibilities to providers um, to allow uh, beneficiary cost sharing as well. Some additional, uh, and I commend the CDC, and John is probably not still on to hear this, but they have provided some additional flexibilities for program staff, allowing them to work on COVID-19 efforts. Um, and this went out to health departments as well, giving them the ability to think about shifting resources in this time of national emergency as well. Also, uh, they moved the due date for their NOFO, PS 20, 2010, from the end of March to May 1st um, to allow some additional flexibilities for state and local health departments who are finding themselves having increasingly to respond to COVID-19. This will alleviate some of that burden for those who were still uh, completing those applications. It also will allow for additional uh, planning to occur in the, in the creation of those applications as well. Our colleagues at SAMHSA have provided some guidance and some resources uh, for on prevention and treatment for those with mental health and substance use disorders as they relate to COVID-19. They've also provided some tips for social distancing, quarantine, and isolation during an infectious disease outbreak. Many of us may find uh, that those tips and uh, strategies useful. Uh, for example, I took a social media break uh, on Saturday and just got offline and just uh, chilled out and, and felt better when I came back to it on su Sunday afternoon. So really, again, ways to take care of yourself during this time, because if you can't take care of yourself, then we can't continue to take care of others, whether they be family, friends, or the communities that we serve. So it's really important. Um, with EHE, as I get ready to delve into that, our implementing agencies will maintain sort of this balanced approach. We will continue conducting critical HIV operations, 
uh, while responding to these emerging needs and stay on top of it. EHE, ending the HIV epidemic and the initiative remains an administration priority. Uh, in my work and in our um, all hands meeting, which we call sort of the all staff meeting that are, are mandatory, this one uh, led by um, our Assistant Secretary for Health, Brett Gerard, uh, he reiterated that uh, ending the HIV epidemic remains an administration priority, that while in the midst of dealing with COVID-19, we still have another epidemic in this country that we need to address. Um, and so we remain uh, both vigilant, we remain committed to moving parts of the initiative forward, and we will try to look and maintain this balanced approach. While we're sensitive to the things that are going on on the ground, we also realize that there are, there's a community of people living with HIV that we need to make sure their needs are addressed, addressed as well as uh, the prevention needs of those that are at risk. And so we will continue to sort of maintain and move forward and figuring out what the appropriate pace of moving forward should be. So, with that, I'll launch into uh, the initiative and the progress that has been made uh, thus far. The Prevention Through Active Community Engagement Program, uh, which uh, focuses on regions four, six, and nine, some of our mo most heavily impacted regions of the country. We've been able to implement uh, putting public health officers in those communities to work with the community around both planning and understanding community needs. Implementation of the Jumpstart, uh, programs both in Cherokee Nation, uh, as well as East Baton Rouge, Baltimore. And, uh, and so those are move, have moved forward as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, phase one jurisdictions developed their draft community plans and submitted those to CDC. Uh, and we have been able to award funds as well, uh, especially through the HRSA programs uh, and some of our NIH programs as well. Uh, and then uh, the uh, HHS prep program, Ready, Set, Prep, has also moved forward. Some of our other accomplishments, um, we implemented the education and awareness program regarding the prep program. Uh, we still continue to move forward on the dashboard, which will uh, give the jurisdictions and sort of our national targets and we'll be there as an outward facing dashboard. I'll talk more about that. We've been busy creating uh, collaborations uh, among other federal colleagues, such as HOPWA, the Office of Women's Health, the Office of Minority Health, Office of Population Affairs, and the Veterans Administration. Uh, we've looked at uh, future collaborations that will help EHE moving forward and necessary partnerships as well. And then, sort of des designing a whole of society approach when it comes to implementation of EHE as well. Um, so our work in the Jumpstarts site, um, these were Jumpstart projects that were funded uh, after the implement, uh, president announced uh, the EHE initiative uh, as part of his State of the Union address in 2019. The Jumpstart cities of DeKalb County, just outside of Georgia, Baltimore City, East Baton Rouge, and Cherokee Nation. You'll see on the screen some of the activities that they had planned to initiate as they're part of their Jumpstart activities. Um, and uh, many of them are definitely underway and successful. So next I will talk about some of the progress. DeKalb County, 30 nurses in correctional facilities trained to deliver point of care HIV testing. Uh, mobile vans and three CBOs using drop-in and pop-up testing reaching high morbidity zip codes, um, and some of their successes in both identifying and bringing individuals back into care, um, and the creation of new, two new uh, PrEP access points for PrEP service delivery. Baltimore City, um, their syringe services program uh, and co-location of that. Um, and so, and U, U equals U ads running on their local college campuses, social media sites, dating apps, um, and expanding of youth services as well in Baltimore City for this highly impacted population. So if you look at all of the Jumpstart sites and some of the things that they have moved forward on, 
it's a, it's a representative sample of some of the work that could be done through EHE um, that is both targeted, that is both data driven. Um, it is, again, in some ways using the best that we know in terms of science, implementation science that is available and can make a difference. Um, I will also highlight that some of them are both about uh, community awareness of HIV and the issues, community awareness and public education around where to, and how to get into care. Um, I think, again, sort of given where we are today and some of the things that we are learning, that challenge of helping individuals understand and navigate our very complex healthcare system. We're seeing this sort of in real time, but it's also something that we've known that is needed and necessary as part of our HIV work. And the jump starts are showing us that as well. Prevention through active community engagement, also known as PACE. Um, what has happened with the PACE officers are that um, in each of these regions, uh, four, six, and nine, there are two senior public health service commission core officers that have been hired. They work very much in close collaboration with my office. We have a weekly call with them to coordinate activities on the ground. They serve both as public health educators and coordinators on the federal level. Um, they are uh, message multipliers in that um, the work that we do to collaborate with them, um, we let them know what's happening both at the federal agency level, my office, and they also serve as sort of our eyes and ears on the ground real time to provide information about what's happening with the planning process, what's happening uh, both at the health department level, uh, and have really uh, become key in our efforts to implement the, um, the EHE initiative. Um, some of the work that they have been uh, doing that uh, also benefits us is ensuring that our EHE messages are delivered to community-based organizations as well from the federal level and those that are involved in planning. Since uh, February, um, PACE officers have engaged in 32 different events. You'll see on the screen some of the types of events that they have been engaged in and the audiences that they have reached. Um, and of the PACE officers, they have uh, reached at least uh, 15 jurisdictions uh, across the country uh, between fall of 2019 and February 6th, when um, in fall of 2019 is when they were hired and put into place within the region. Um, they have been very instrumental in our work with Ready, Set, Prep. Some of them have, they worked very closely with our staff in OIDP. Uh, and through our calls and our work together, we have been setting up a number, uh, we had been setting up a number of jurisdictional visits to promote the Ready, Set, Prep program, uh, engagement with the community, and really spending some time learning about prep access and prep attitudes and engagement, as well as successes and challenges in implementing PrEP programs within the regions as well. So the Ready, Set, PrEP program uh, is a nationwide program that's led by uh, HHS. Uh, and it is really uh, working in collaboration to educate about the benefits of PrEP and PrEP medications at no cost for those who qualify. This was made possible through the Gilead donation of Truvada to HHS to expand access to those who are uninsured in the United States. Um, it provides enough medication for up to 200,000 people per year. Uh, and AHHS has been uh, bearing the cost for patient eligibility, enrollment, and building that network, uh, and building the network of qualifying ph pharmacies. The program targets those who lack insurance, health insurance coverage for outpatient prescription drugs, uh, have a valid on-label prescription, and have appropriate testing that shows that they are HIV negative. It's a nationwide program, even though it is EHE focused, uh, and that means that states that are not part of the phase one EHE jurisdictions can uh, access and uh, refer patients to the program. Um, so in terms of the timeline for the program overall, uh, in May 2019, 
Secretary Azar announced the agreement between the administration and Gilead for the 200,000 uh, for medications for up to 200,000 individuals. And then in December, we officially launched the program itself. As part of the program, there are uh, co-sponsorship agreements, uh, Avita Pharmacy, Long's Pharmacy Solutions, CVS Health, Health Mart, Rite Aid, and Walgreens have donated services to prep for, to distribute prep medication to qualified patients. And this is, uh, gives us the ability to provide medications in over 24,000 combined locations across all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. In addition, these medications uh, and these pharmacies have also donated their mail order services uh, for patients who request PrEP medications be mailed to their homes. So that too has been part of the agreement. Starting April 1st, uh, patients will only be able to receive their PrEP medications at these co-sponsoring pharmacies on behalf of the program. Again, over 24,000 locations uh, and the inclusion of mail order, um, that work from the pharmacies is saving the federal government uh, a lot of resources as well. The PrEP education and awareness campaign has, continues to be ongoing. We're currently working within phase two um, of the program as well. Uh, the program materials include fact sheets for, for download that are both in English and Spanish, healthcare provider resources, uh, and fact sheets for Indian Health Service. There are posters in English and Spanish, as well as information cards, social media toolkits, and shareable graphics that are also available through the program. Also, uh, in terms of social media, especially in this day and age, uh, there are social media tools that are also available and blog posts for your use and for download regarding the program as well. Those of you who wish to access and promote the program. All of that, including basic information about the program, eligibility and enrollment instructions can be found on hiv.gov. Our enrollment page uh, is at getyourprep.com for eligibility determination and enrollment. There is also a call center that is available. Again, uh, those who wish to enroll, it's a nationwide program. It, while we are targeting the phase one EHE jurisdictions, all, anyone in the country, uh, it's country nationwide uh, in terms of enrollment and eligibility for the program. And again, the call center phone number is on the, the, the screen, as well as the enrollment page at getyourprep.com. So a little bit about the dashboard. Uh, and we're still continuing our work on the dashboard. The dashboard will be an outward facing dashboard that will, that will include the national and the jurisdictional indicators and targets uh, for EHE. Users will be able to uh, click on the map and choose which jurisdiction profile they wish to, to view. We've been working very closely with CDC on, on the dashboard and the data for the dashboard, uh, as well as our uh, contracted entity uh, and entities that you can see on the screen. Um, there's an interagency working group of federal officials that are working on the dashboard and really helping us uh, think about sort of the user experience. The static version of the dashboard will be available for launch this spring. Uh, and again, we continue to work on that. Um, there is an interactive uh, dashboard uh, that we are working on for phase two. Uh, and that interactive portion of the dashboard will allow you to compare um, to compare jurisdictions and jurisdictional progress. It may even include some additional modeling, uh, the ability to model uh, different uh, indicators, uh, but we're still, we have not fully begun uh, that portion of the work on the interactive dashboard. So that is still something that is evolving. Uh, so what's ahead for us in, in this whole piece of it? Uh, we, uh, the dashboard itself 
uh, which should be coming uh, in a month or two, will be ready. Um, again, we're hoping that the, the look, the feel, the user experience is one that is both inviting and that it provides updates on our progress regarding EHE. So in terms of funding and future funding, um, so we've talked a little bit about, I talked a little bit about uh, funding that was in place. Um, the planning aspect of the CDC's uh, funding opportunity announcement, um, those applications were submitted, they were reviewed, feedback was due to the jurisdictions by the end of March. Uh, I am, did not have the chance before this presentation to check with CDC to see if that still be, will be uh, released um, this week or will they wait in light of everything else going on and release it at, uh, at a later date. Um, but those applications have been reviewed. Um, the, uh, the review included uh, an interagency review uh, that included both CDC, project officer staff, HRSA, folks from our office, OIGP, as well as the PACE officers who were in the field. I spoke a little bit about this, about sort of the, the change in the date, uh, the due date being moved uh, to May 1st uh, with proposed award start date August 1st of 2020. Since that start date has been moved from June to August, there will be some, um, in, there will be an impact on EHE implementation moving forward. The interagency team has not gotten together yet to discuss what that impact overall will be, um, but that will definitely have an impact on some of our work uh, within the pillars itself. Also in terms of EHE and EHE moving forward, uh, the HRSA grants uh, have moved forward for uh, the treatment pillar, as well as the work that was associated with the Bureau of Primary Health Care to expand PrEP access in community health centers. All of those awards were made in March. Again, uh, given our current situation, we have not had the opportunity as an interagency team to come together and really talk about sort of the impact given, given what's happening on the ground yet. Uh, with the ability to move forward. But as you all are very much aware, many of our health centers, many of our Ryan White providers are also uh, responding to some of the uh, needs uh, that have been emerging out of the COVID-19 response. NIH, uh, to date, uh, their award start date still is slated for July of 2020. Um, and this was looking at uh, different models or successful models for enhancing the screening and treatment of mental health and substance abuse disorders at the Ryan White funded sites. Um, so this partnership, it looks like it's still going to move forward and we are still looking to the knowledge that I have today uh, as a July, July start date for the award date for that. Uh, SAMHSA and its September start date for uh, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, looking at prevention navigators for racial and ethnic minorities. Again, uh, this is a minority AIDS initiative funded. Um, SAMHSA received 82 applications. And again, their start date, uh, award start date is still slated for September 2020. Um, some of the work we've been doing with some of our other federal partners um, really have included some of the work that was done with HACWA uh, and their ability uh, they've been very interested in the EHE initiative. They are a key partner. I think that throughout many of the listening engagements that uh, federal officials have done <laughs> over the last year, the issue of housing and the need to address the housing needs of people living with HIV, as well as the impact that housing status has on health outcomes, has all been made very clear with them. So one of the first assignments that I was given when I started back in September uh, with uh, OASH, the Office of, Assistant, uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary, was to really look at ways that we could bring HAPWA and our HUD partners into some of our EHG work. Uh, we've been, they were pleased to, to really engage with us, really think through some of the issues. And one of the things that they have done is create a resource tool 
that outlines some of the key aspects of the HOPWA program in each of the 57 jurisdictions uh, that will be made available to the jurisdictions outlining funding amounts, type of housing, type of support services that how HOPWA is funding in each of the jurisdictions, the number of clients, cost per client, fair market rent. And what we hope this will do will give us the ability to not only better understand HOPWA and its impact on the local communities, but also in cases where there's a desire to use EHG funding to replicate some of the HOPWA or expand or create new uh, HOPWA-like programs using the EHG funding. It will give us the data and the foundation to be able to do that uh, using some of HUD's data and information as well. Um, we're also having discussions on how to engage HUD um, in much broader in our uh, initiative. Uh, there was even talk of when we are able to do site visits, possibly doing joint HUD HHS site visits to some of the jurisdictions as well. Some of our work with other uh, EH uh, federal partners involves some of our work around the awareness days, um, development of messages and distribution of ready set prep materials, uh, looking at ways to increase awareness among professional associations, the business community, academic institutions, and really using some of our federal partners to think about how we might go about this whole of society initiative. We've also been very pleased that the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs has signed on and committed to the goal of ending the HIV epidemic among the VA system. Um, they're currently serving 31,000 veterans. Uh, and their goal is offering HIV testing to at least uh, to all veterans, also rapidly improving access to PrEP services, as well as combating stigma and discrimination within the VA. We've been working also with them to ensure that they have um, access to our HHS tools in their work. Uh, and also we are in conversation with them about, especially some of our jurisdictions where the VA plays a, a large presence and a large provider of care, um, access to the data that may help us um, both improve our surveillance, but also improve uh, coordination between our, our various systems. Some of our upcoming collaborations are really looking at the role that Medicare and Medicaid services uh, play in, term, in both uh, paying for uh, HIV care, treatment, and prevention. Um, also, their work with us as serving as members of the Federal Implementation Group for the National HIV Strategic Plan. And we are working to sort of prior, prioritize some of those discussions uh, regarding both policy and program with CMS. Also looking at the Department of Labor and Treasury and the role that they play among private payers. Uh, and practi private practitioners and payers, and really having some conversations with them about EHE, what they can do, and trying to leverage and pull some of those policy levers that they have. Again, I've talked about this as sort of a whole of society initiative and how we are engaging across various sectors and the importance of that. And I think we're also sort of seeing that, and that's one of the lessons learned and one of the things I think that we've always known in our HIV work that as we sort of address this global pandemic and the public health crisis that's before us, another way that we're sort of using some of these lessons learned that I think will allow us to be both su successful in addressing both of these epidemics. So again, I thank you all for the opportunity uh, and, and uh, I'll be with you until around noon and given the opportunity, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Dr. Phillips, and, and good morning to AIDS Watch community. I'm Carl Baloney. I'm Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at AIDS United. Um, Dr. Phillips, we're really thrilled to have heard from you regarding the Federal Ending the Epidemic Initiative, the updates you provided, um, and especially to hear it from you, a member of our own community. And speaking of community, we have been receiving questions in the chat, and we hope that you might answer um, a question um, in, in, in the in, uh, light of our time and we're a little bit over right now i'm going to ask one question and then we're going to actually pull all the questions as we're doing with dr merman and we're going to send them to your office and we'll post uh the answers on our website but in the meantime uh one question that really stood out for me was 
So for the jurisdictional planning process, the guidance for CDC's 191906 funding only lists sign-in sheets and a letter of concurrence as measures of community engagement. What else is OIDP doing to ensure local and state health departments are meaningfully engaged in communities in this process? So thanks for that question, Carl. I think, you know, in addition to the, the letters, um, one of the things that I think is probably different from, from uh, previous uh, requirements where we've had community engagement, many of us on the federal level have been out in the community um, and have been getting, I would say, feedback from the community throughout the process, both the community and our national organizations with regard to what's happening. So I think the ability to compare what's on paper in those statements of concurrence based upon what we also really know uh, is happening is one of the ways that we're going to compare and contrast sort of the realities versus what we receive sort of submitted on paper to Atlanta. The other thing that um, I know um, Dr. Eugene McCray has been clear about with regard to uh, the planning process is that those documents that were submitted in December, many of them are, uh, they are draft and that there will be substantial input from the federal level to improve that uh, community engagement process. We're aware that some of those jurisdictions didn't, some of them submitted a plan to plan. Uh, some of them did not necessarily take a step back and think about who's been missing from the planning table that we need to engage now. And so uh, the federal agencies have come together and they will be giving that feedback as well as pushing uh, for more engagement. Well, thank you, Dr. Phillips. We appreciate that answer and we appreciate the commitment to continue to engage the community. Um, so please join the rest of the participants and uh, watch the, the remainder of the, the conference. Um, have a great day. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from um, members of the HIV STD Partnership. Um, the HIV STD Partnership is comprised of AIDS United uh, and headed by the CEO Jesse Milan Jr by the National Coalition of State and Territorial STD Directors, headed by David Harvey, the AIDS Institute, headed by Michael Ruppel, NASDAQ, headed by Stephen Lee, and NMAC, headed by Paul Kawada. Paul? Hi, can you hear me right now? So listen, everybody, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, Kenyon, you're going to need to start my video. I can't start it. Ah, there I go. So I need to say something as I, as before I go into my presentation. As I was getting on the call, the meeting this morning, I received word that Barbara Joseph has passed. I don't know if any of you know Barbara, but she was an extraordinary warrior, a black woman living with HIV who I could always count on to make sure that I knew the issues for her community. I don't know if she passed to the virus. I just know that she died. And I wanted to take a moment to hold up her name and to hold up all the people that we are losing and who are sick right now. So if you'll take a moment with me and let's just have a moment of quiet. Thank you. As we walk into this next section, before I do it, I also want to acknowledge there are 375 people currently on this webinar. I think that is extraordinary. I want to congratulate the organizers 
for their amazing work in flipping a meeting so quickly to become virtual. And I've been reading all of the questions and comments in the chat section and in the Q&A section. And I, I, I feel like that's an amazing way to connect with your community. The one thing that I would say around the chat section that I saw early on, there were so many questions from people living with HIV about what does this mean to us? And, and I wanna say what wasn't said, but is really important. We don't know right now. There's only been one study that I'm aware of around COVID-19 and HIV, and that was a study that was done in the UK at a very small group of people and did not produce what I would call meaningful results. And so to all the people living with HIV who are on this call, we need you to be really careful. These are very, very scary times. And we just don't know right now all of the answers to your questions. And I know there's a lot of fear. And I know there's a lot of, is this affecting men more than women? Is it affecting people of color more than white people? Is it, is it affecting a certain region? And, and the truth is, we just don't know. And, and that lack of knowledge creates fear and creates trauma. And I don't want to traumatize your lives any more than they're already traumatized. But I need you to be careful. I need all of us to be careful to get through this moment. So I was asked specifically to talk about the partnership and how we came together. And the partnership came together back in November of 2016. Um, it's really the fault of Murray Penner. I don't know if Murray is one of the 377 people on this call, but Murray was the person who called up me and David Harvey and said, what are we going to do? How are we going to protect the HIV appropriations? And so we got together with a group of folks who had Washington presence and decided we, we needed to try something different. And so what we did was we pulled our resources and we hired a lobbying firm and a communications firm to represent the partnership to talk about HIV, to talk about STDs, and to talk about hepatitis in a different way. You know, as a result of all of this, we had many conversations with the administration and with members of Congress. And, and I believe that we were instrumental in part of the EHE efforts, that we were the folks who met with the secretary, who met with the ASH, and who met with Fauci to talk about what is it going to take to make this happen. And so in, in understanding of time, I'm going to turn this over to Michael Ruppel from the AIDS Institute to talk about what we've done and the next phase of our work. Michael. Do I have to leave? Can you hear me? Now? There we go. Yeah, now we can hear you. There we go. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Ruppel, I'm Executive Director of the AIDS Institute, and I'm talking to you from Tampa, Florida. Uh, the AIDS Institute began as a grassroots volunteer state-driven advocacy organization in the mid-1980s. Um, and I'm giving you a little bit of our background because many of you don't know who we are. Um, and why we're part of this partnership. But today as a national organization, we focus on policy advocacy, research and education for HIV uh, alongside hepatitis, and we collaborate with other disease-focused policy advocates. Our talented team um, is based in Tampa, Tallahassee, Washington, D.C., and Raleigh, North Carolina. So this type of technology that we're now using as our new normal um, is, helps us every day with our work. And we have an amazing board of directors from all over the country and hundreds of advisory board members informing our work, which of course includes leadership from people living with HIV. We continue to maintain our roots in the community as a Florida and Southern HIV and AIDS policy and advocacy group and 
our unique structure of our state and federal policy work combined with research, advocacy, education, capacity building, and convening brought us to this table of these five organizations in this partnership. So we each represent slightly different constituencies, which brings diversity to our work. Um, collectively, we have an amazing pool of talented and passionate staff and boards, which also allows us um, lots of different perspectives when we're tackling an issue and, and coming up with a, a position. Um, and I truly believe that this partnership is a great example of what can be done and what can be accomplished when you break down the barriers, the silos of these organizations and formally commit to working together for common goals. And although this type of partnership is happening all over the country, we know we're never gonna end this HIV epidemic without working together even more than we do now. And we all know it's sometimes challenging to work together at an organizational level, but with an open mind and open heart, and you can know you can achieve really great things together. And I challenge you all to find ways to build those bridges um, to others in your community that you're not currently working with. And I'm confident you will be glad that you do that. And I'm gonna turn this over to Jesse. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Paul. And, and our, our partners at NASDAQ and also the National Coalition of STD Directors. When the five of us came together in, as Paul said, in November of 2016, it was literally at midnight when Donald Trump was declared the, win the winner. And I have to say that all of us were scared. And, I, and I'm feeling this same sense of terror again this very morning uh, because of the coronavirus and because of the economy and because we're once again in the middle of a presidential election. And I'm hoping that AIDS Watch this year and our partnership can continue to show what unity is about. Because we came together to show unity to what we thought would be a very unfriendly uh, administration. And we recognize that there would be so many competing factors out there that the, uh, that the new president would be dealing with that if we could at least show that we were united on some key issues, that we could uh, get to the table and stay at the table on behalf of the various constituencies that we represent. You know that AIDS United has our public policy council of 56 of the leading HIV AIDS organizations across the country. Uh, we have about 200 grantees at any one time uh, who've received funding through us. And I think HIV, uh, AIDS United also helps represent the HIV workforce through our grantees and our PPC members, people who are working in social services as well as clinical services, people who are doing all the spectrum of prevention, treatment, care, and support. So whenever we come to the table, AU with our partners, the other four organizations, we bring a very strong presence of unity. And that unity has been focused uh, with Congress around appropriations and around anything related to access to care, including access to PrEP and urging, of course, Medicaid expansion. And by uh, recognizing the three comorbidities of HIV, STIs, and, and TB, B, as well as uh, viral hepatitis, we are making it clear that whatever you do for one impacts the other. And I think that's what our unity is doing. And so, I'm so I've been so grateful to be um, in collaboration with these, three organ these four organizations. And I've been happy on our behalf to take our message to Dr. Gerard, to Dr. Redfield, to Laura Cheever and others, because when we come together, we get to share a message of strength and unity. And our newest partner, NASDAQ has been in this since the very beginning, but our newest partner uh, among the five of us is, is Dr. Stephen Lee, who's the new uh, ED of NASDAQ. And, and Stephen, I'd like you to, to share your thoughts as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And um, thank you to the organizers of AIDS Watch 2020 for inviting me to participate. This actually is my, my first AIDS Watch. So um, I, I'm totally in awe at the number of people who are, um, who are on, on, on the webinar and, and participating and actively participating based on the, uh, the, chat, the chat questions and Q&A that, that I'm seeing. 
Um, so NASTAD's committed to ending the dual epidemics of, of HIV and hepatitis. And one, what, what's really struck me over the morning so far is that four really major things have emerged um, as, as priorities for ending the epidemic. There's the need to end stigma and the various isms that, 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 that are associated with stigma, racism, transphobia, homophobia, um, stigma associated with, with sexism, um, et cetera. Uh, we're also seeing the need to ensure that there's equitable access to HIV care and prevention services. Uh, both uh, uh, across, the, across the board, but especially in, in jurisdictions where we're seeing um, spread of the increase of uh, spread of the virus. Um, and then also we're seeing that there are needs to address the various policy barriers that are impacting, uh, impacting disease, specifically Medicaid expansion, syringe access programs, uh, HIV criminalization uh, laws, um, et cetera. And actually most probably most importantly is making sure that there are health centers that are able to provide access to care and treatment services where people, where people live. Um, and, and then finally, the other, the fourth kind of big thing that seems to have emerged in the course of the conversation and during the course of the looking at the chat are making sure that we're addressing the non-clinical aspects of HIV, that is the housing, food security, mental health services, and, and um, employment. Um, so the, for me, what, what NASAD really focuses on is, is the, the need for three major things for us to accomplish addressing all of these issues. Integration, coordination, and accountability. Ensuring that there is integration across at multiple levels, across program areas, as Jesse just mentioned, HIV, hepatitis, STI, TB, and other infectious diseases. Integration along the continuum of care, of prevention, care, and treatment, but then also integration across service delivery models, such as hospitals, clinics, community-based organizations, and community-based services. Following on integration would be coordination, making sure that all of these agencies, all of these uh, uh, groups, all of these services are coordinated at multiple levels, federal, state, city, um, and certainly coordinated across program areas and coordinated across service delivery models. And finally, there's accountability. We need to hold ourselves accountable and we need to hold each other accountable for achieving the ambitious goals that Harold just outlined as part of the ending the HIV AIDS, AIDS epidemic. This really will be facilitated by collecting and sharing relevant data that are reviewed and analyzed and used for, for program improvements. And then finally, I will just end by saying, I think this has really come up a lot throughout the morning and, and, and I want to make sure that we, we re I personally reiterate it and, and show my complete support for this, which is the underlying need for us to have meaningful engagement of communities most impacted by, by the epidemic. Uh, this work needs to focus especially on inclusion of Black and Lat Latinx, transgender and justice involved populations. Uh, we want to make sure that resources are invested in these community-based organizations. And then we want to make sure that these um, individuals and populations are included as part of the health workforce and that's addressing the, the, these epidemics, serving as peer educators and or uh, peer navigators. So I'll, I'll end there and just say thank you for the opportunity to participate. And I, and I really look forward to the success of the day. And I'll hand it over to, to my colleague, David, at, at NCSD. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me. Just want to do a quick sound check. Kenyon, all OK? You're good. Thank you very much. Um, well, greetings from icy, snowy New Hampshire. I am normally in Washington, DC, but I have uh, relocated to a little town called Lempster, New Hampshire, uh, while all this uh, uh, stuff is going on with uh, coronavirus. And uh, I wanna join my colleagues, um, Jesse, Stephen, Michael, and Paul, of course, in the comments that they have made uh, about the very important work of the partnership. Um, knowing that this is a lobbying event and that you all will be taking action later today, messaging, sending messages of Congress that are more important now than ever before, 
uh, because of what is going on with coronavirus. I want to uh, just highlight a couple of very important facts and developments um, that I hope you'll highlight in some of the messaging that you will send to Congress uh, later today. First of all, I know uh, all of you know we uh, are no strangers um, in the HIV and STI community to out of control epidemics. Um, in the STD specific world, uh, we have never had higher numbers of STDs uh, in American history. And that is a very sobering statement to make. Uh, these are very serious um, infectious diseases that have uh, some very, uh, very bad health outcomes for some who experience them, women disproportionately impacted by uh, STIs. Uh, we are at the point where we have 2.4 million cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis in this country. Um, cases of congenital syphilis are at about 1,200 to 1,300 uh, now. Uh, so these are serious sobering statistics that really complicate our ability to end the HIV epidemic. And I think you all know, research has shown a lot of visibility around this in this past year, um, that one in 10 cases of HIV is a result of first having an STD. Uh, we think that's a vast undercount, by the way. And all of this speaks to the very important syndemic approach uh, that we need um, as we think about how to end HIV. And so uh, I have been thrilled as NCSD has been and our members across the country to join um, in an enhanced way around ending HIV uh, discussions. And of course, uh, we have been included in the um, new initiative by this administration, uh, which we are grateful for. Um, Specifically in the STD sector, there's not a lot of money, I think, as you all know. Um, currently today, the system is funded at about $160 million. Uh, we got a very small funding increase this last cycle through appropriations, uh, which we are incredibly grateful for and humbled for. And when I say an increase, I'm only talking about $3 million, $3 to $4 million uh, new dollars. But politically, this is very significant. Uh, because we've bo broken through a log jam uh, on the Hill. Um, STDs, believe it or not, have not been increased in funding in just under 20 years. Uh, and that is why uh, we have an out of control uh, epidemic in this country. There is one federal funding line for STDs, dedicated uh, uh, federal STD funding line uh, at CDC. That's where that uh, line item goes of $160 million. Uh, however, the rest of the system uh, plays an incredibly important role in STD prevention, care, and research. Uh, but my comments, uh, just to clarify, are focused on that CDC uh, line. So in this appropriation cycle, we're asking for an increase of $60 million uh, for the base program, which would bring it um, to $220 million annually for STD prevention. Uh, a little bit of that money goes for care. Um, and 20 million of that is specifically for um, a direct service initiative. Uh, we are trying to desperately support uh, STD clinics. Uh, there is no federal funding stream for STD clinics um, in this country. I now wanna just very quickly acknowledge, and I see Carl who wants me to finish up my comments. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what's going on with coronavirus because uh, 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 in the last week, the STD system has largely come to a screeching halt um, as the majority of disease investigation specialists have been redeployed to coronavirus. Uh, we have been hustling and asked for a 200 million allocation through the CDC funding process uh, to radically increase DIS in the United States, but who can play a very important role in coronavirus, but can also then contribute to making sure that we don't have as a result of this even higher <laughs> STD rates by the time that we're in at the end of this um, situation with coronavirus. There's only 1,600 DIS in the United States. We wanna double it um, and increase, supports, increase support for um, the STD program that funds the majority of that workforce that, can do, that does outbreak response. So with that, I am gonna complete my comments. Carl, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I wanna thank all of you across the country for embracing NCSD embracing the STD sector, 
um, and thinking about new ways that we can bring these sectors together um, to end HIV. Thank you, David, that was wonderful. Um, and thank you to all the EDs for sharing um, how the partnership came together and about the work that you all do. Um, I wanna acknowledge um, some movement that's going on in the chat. I wanna uh, uplift Sophia Cass, who was a wonderful presenter near our opening, um, and that we'll have several other female uh, panelists represented over the course of today. Um, but it's a really important flag that we have significant diversity in everything that we do. It makes every conversation more rich. Um, next, I would like to introduce Andrew Spildinner, Vice Chair for the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Um, can you see me? Let's try to figure this out. We can see both of you. Okay. So Ace says hello. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you all for coming together like this. Um, I miss uh, seeing you all, so this is exciting to be in community in this way. I do a lot of work in disability, and um, one of the things, a comment a, a colleague of mine made um, at a meeting, we had a disabled uh, academics, she said to me, you know, the thing I love about uh, coming to these meetings is like we learn new ways to hug each other. And I just want to kind of make that comment that this is a time to like learn new ways to hug each other. Um, anyways, miss you all. Uh, let's get on with my presentation. So I am charged with one of the things that we uh, thought about was that um, since we're meeting virtually, we should talk about uh, what does it mean to talk about your story virtually. And let's see. So I'm charged with doing that. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, partially because um, we are behind on time and I wanna kinda do what I can to help with that. Um, so the slides will be shared uh, by AIDS United. Um, I'll email them afterwards um, with this, probably as a PDF. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk about uh, Twitter primarily and how do you use Twitter as a tool for activism and why. Um, there are a lot of people on uh, the webinar that are experts. Um, Mark King, I've noticed, very active in the chat box. Mark is definitely an expert in this area um, on how to tell your story virtually. But I'm going to go over some basics. Um, a little bit about me, um, and if you want to contact me, um, it's easy to, to email me. I'm, I'm a university professor. Um, I'm also a person living with HIV and a gay man of color. Um, I am the vice chair of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. Um, you've heard from us. We are a partner uh, on AIDS Watch and we uh, love being part of it. We're a network of uh, people living with HIV advocates. And, um, I have a blog at pause.com and I use Twitter a lot, a lot. I use Twitter when I teach. It's really obnoxious. People should stop me, but they can't. Okay. Um, so some things to think about is that people's a lot of times our health policy is actually determined not by science all the time, but by emotions and social values. And so when we talk about um, how do we change legislators' minds with your story, it's all about like the emotion that you can invoke and what, um, you know, uh, can you connect with the people? Can people connect with your story? And so this doesn't change. Uh, this doesn't change in an online environment, um, but it's important to note that, um, you know, there are some, there are some change, there are some rules that change in the online environment. So number one is people do tend to be less polite and um, have less social rules um, online than they are in person. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that all of your posts are searchable. And so everything you've done can be found unless you um, edit and delete stuff and even then screen captures. Um, the other thing about uh, online life is uh, just, to be honest, trolls suck. Um, I'm very public in my life and uh, I get trolled relatively uh, frequently. Sorry, it's my phone. Um, and uh, they just suck. So there are people that, um, you know, sometimes they're not even people, they could be bots. So it's not, if you see a troll, just block them. Um, and I'll talk about why blocking is important. So a few things about social media I just wanna to touch on in terms of some of its effect and again, you'll get all these slides. A lot of these are just do's and don't lists. 
So I'm not gonna go into the do's and don'ts. You can do that yourself. Um, and again, feel free to email me, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, so the two kind of effects I really wanna talk about about social media is number one, it uh, has a flattening effect around credible and non-credible sources. So as we've seen um, on social media, experts, quote unquote, expert power that we used to attribute to medical doctors, researchers, reporters, um, we used to have this idea there were experts in the field. Now, like people, anybody can tweet and, you know, create a meme and, you know, say they're a reporter um, or whatever, uh, say they're experts. You know, uh, as we've seen with COVID-19, there's a ton of misinformation out there um, on social media. Um, some of it comes from elected officials and other people um, that are in power. Just going to say that. Um, but it's important that we understand that social media does have this effect, that, uh, that people are listening to, to non-expert voices and um, some people will, dis will not believe you. And, you know, that's part of being in social media. The other thing is that social media produces a bubble effect. So there are algorithms at play that um, recommend different people to you and recommend different ideas. And so it's important to understand that you're actually in an echo chamber with a lot of social media. So even though you might agree with everybody in your circle, when you step out of that circle, they don't always agree. And it's important to kind of know that when you're going into social media. And a couple personal tips, um, you don't own anything on social media, the company does. So everything you post is actually owned by a company. Um, so I just always want, want people to be clear about that. Um, also take social media breaks. It's really easy to get into a Twitter hole or um, Instagram hole or any, especially nowadays. And that can drive, it's driven me a little batty, to tell you the truth. Um, my dog is very, is a great calming tool. Um, anyways. Uh, Instagram I bring up, I'm gonna focus on Twitter. Instagram I bring up because oftentimes our organizations um, don't understand the value of Instagram. Instagram reaches a much younger audience than Twitter or Facebook do. Um, Instagram is more, uh, is a image driven site. Um, and it's a very dynamic site in, in terms of like gaining followers and building relationships with people. Um, and in this age of kind of this internet, um, you know, building a website is not enough anymore. Um, people aren't gonna necessarily find you just if you build a website. So I always bring up Instagram. I use Instagram a lot, but I'm gonna focus on Twitter today. So if you don't know what Twitter is, <laughs> um, Twitter is a multi-directional communication platform. And one of the things that it is famous for was that it pioneered both the idea of microblogging, there used to be 140 character limits, and the idea of hashtagging. And since its inception, we've seen Twitter evolve. It's, it's, you can post with more characters now. It's definitely way more political if you go on Twitter now. I mean, it is just people screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, we've also seen that there are bots on Twitter and, that's what, and bots are automated AI um, interfaces that will uh, pretend that they're people and talk to you. And it's kind of creepy. I've had AIs come, I've had bots come after me before and when it, I didn't realize they were bots and I would go, like, go in and talk to them. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to a bot. <laughs> um, one of my good friends, Cecilia Chung, once stopped me on Twitter and she said, you're talking to a bot, stop it. You look crazy. Um, which I greatly appreciated her honesty. Um, but that's, you know, I, it's important to realize that sometimes we're not interacting with real people. Most of your government officials, um, elected officials, companies, government agencies have Twitter accounts at this point. One of the things I will say is it's important to follow key people as well as your friends. Um, be mindful of what you disclose online. Um, it's forever out there. Um, don't troll. If you feel yourself trolling, step away from the device. Like if somebody says something terrible and you're like, oh my God, you're a terrible person, blah, blah, blah. Step away from the device. <laughs> Put it down, step away. Come back when you're not gonna be screaming. Um, one of the things that we'll say is that uh, develop a relationship uh, with your elected officials and the companies you use on Twitter so they have a record that they know you. Um, <clears throat> why would anyone pay attention to you? Number one, if you're talking to an elected official, be very clear you're a constituent. Um, always lead with that. I, am, I live in your district. Um, elected officials pay attention to people who can vote for them and who can protest them. Those are the things that elected officials are concerned about. So always rem remind people that you're a constituent if you are tweeting at a company, 
remind them that you're a customer. Um, one of the uh, one of the ways in which um, I've been stuck in various airports, and one of the ways that I've managed to deal with airlines is to tweet at them. Um, it's much faster than doing a, a phone call or trying to find somebody sometimes. Um, so it's important to kind of build up that relationship. The other thing is uh, that people pay attention to who you're connected with. So my Twitter account, for instance, is followed by the Ellen DeGeneres show. And um, that alone puts like a huge, people will respond to me. Um, I don't know why they follow me, but they do. Um, and finally, again, uh, one of the things that people want to see is, do you have enough personal pics to prove that you're not a bot? And so, um, you know, and I don't mean like put your whole life out there. I just mean like a couple shots of your personal life. Like, oh, this is me in nature. Oh, look, me walking my dog. And I apologize for not being able to get to the chat. Um, I'm trying to get through these slides. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer questions after the presentation, if that's okay with folks. Um, just put them in the question part of the chat, the Q&A part of the chat and not the chat itself. Um, it's hard to kind of scroll the chat. Um, okay, so some tweet tips. Uh, make your political tweets pithy and memorable. Um, narrow your message down to specific asks. Um, threads are something that you can do when you're more familiar with the platform, so don't try them at first. Um, don't hashtag your whole tweet. You know, don't do hashtag, don't, hashtag, hashtag, hashtag your, hashtag whole, hashtag tweet. That's annoying. It doesn't get you anywhere. Be very strategic about the use of hashtags. There are a lot of hashtags in our space that we can use. Um, I've noticed Drew Gibson putting a lot of great tweets on the chat. And so shout out to Drew, Drew's great at Twitter. Um, so, you know, you can just copy and paste those tweets and put them in your Twitter account. Um, and he's using the uh, hashtag AIDS watch. Um, but there are a lot of other hashtags like HIV, HIV is not a crime. And uh, one of my favorite hashtags is crypt the vote, which is a huge following. Um, so it's, it's another way to kind of branch out from just our HIV space to reach other advocates. These are some tools for Twitter. Um, you can go over them on your own. The one I want to emphasize is block trolls immediately because then they can't access your social network. Um, if you don't block them and you only mute them, they can still access people. So it's important to block them. And finally, for privacy, keep in mind what information you share. Um, turn off your, geo, your geolocator, especially because of the environment we live in in terms of gender-based violence. Um, I really want to like highlight that you don't want to show people where you live. Um, I got a bomb threat a couple years ago. We passed a law in the state of California modernizing our HIV criminalization laws. And um, I gave a presentation and a student tweeted it that I was doing this presentation. And like that day I got a bomb threat where somebody sent a Google map to my office um, with an email that said, uh, stop spreading AIDS faggot or we'll blow you up. And you know, fortunately, I work for a university with a police department who dealt with the FBI and dealt with all that. But it's important to know, like, there are people out there that will kind of mess with you. And was it a real threat? I don't know, but it messed with my head. So keep that in mind. And when you disclose something, it stays out there. So I wanted to show some examples and close out with some examples. So one thing is, if you want to look at Twitter feeds that I find really useful, Yola Akil and um, Alice Wong are two amazing people on social media platforms. They're amazing people in general, but um, they have really great accounts if you want to look at like ways to put in kind of what you believe in with Twitter. Um, so those are their accounts up there, Yola Akil and SF Dyer Wolf. Um, I have an assignment in my class where I have the class track um, elected officials for a month to look at what they put on social media. And it's really interesting when you look at like an AOC versus like I randomly picked a state governor. State governors have really boring Twitter accounts. Um, and you look at kind of how they're not able to engage. Whereas like AOC, for what, however you feel about her, she's amazing at um, engagement. Um, I also wanted to show video. And so one of the things about video is it gives a different kind of engagement and people are um, more likely to retweet video. We know that. Um, this is Barbara Joseph. Uh, Paul mentioned her earlier. Barbara uh, 
passed away. She was at decades of activism. She'd been living with HIV for 34 years. Um, and uh, she helped build United We Rise in Houston, which is uh, a joint effort uh, to get Black people involved in the HIV response. And so um, I'm just going to show a video of her. My name is Barbara Joseph. My pronoun is she and her. Um, and I'm from Houston, Texas, originally from San Antonio. I am a woman, heterosexual woman, that has lived with HIV for 32 years. I was uh, infected in 1984 before the we knew about blood. Uh, and I was given a diagnosis that I would be dead within a year. I've been trying to end this epidemic for 30 years. I started, um, what brought me to the end of this? I'm not sure we're going to end it as we are now, but we're certainly working hard to try. Um, we've been talking and talking and talking for those years that I've been working with this arena, and we have slowed it down but certainly we haven't ended it. This convenience is important because for the last 10 years, we've been asking for the blacks to be able to sit down at a table, to be able to do things and talk about our own issues, not somebody else's issues, to be able to address the issues that face us on a daily basis, to be able to touch those people that we need to touch and not be told who to touch. Uh, so um, this convening is very important to me. So that was Barbara Joseph, for those people who have never met her. There are a couple other examples embedded. Um, one is Diana Michelle from Puerto Rico. And here we have a hyperlink to Max Boykin, but you can check those on their own, on your own. Um, when you get the slides. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, let me stop the share. And I will look at question and answers. Um, and thank you all for coming. And thanks for everyone for putting this together. And thanks, Kenyon, at The Body for being great at facilitating this. <laughs> Next. Um, okay, thank you so much, uh, Andy. I'm, um, unfortunately, just uh, we're over time, so I'm gonna have to um, unfortunately mix the questions. But again, um, similar to we did with our federal partners, if you're interested in uh, asking Andy a question, please uh, put it in the Q&A box and we will uh, make sure that he gets those and um, can get them back to you. Um, so uh, again, thank you for that. Uh, next, um, before we... Um, kind of break for the afternoon sessions, which will run concurrently. Uh, I want to uh, ask uh, Marianne uh, to uh, join us and um, who will uh, close us out this morning uh, with, the, with the looking ahead. Thank you, Kenyon. To end the plenary, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that AIDS Watch has historically been a place for community and a place to join together and demand that elected officials pass laws that address the needs of people living with HIV. And in its 27th year, we clearly face unprecedented challenges. We face laws and policies that continue more the needs of our communities and we also face the COVID-19 pandemic, which makes us unable to congregate in the same physical space. But AIDS Watch was something much larger than an in-person meeting or a schedule of appointments on the Hill. It was never just about two days in Washington, DC. AIDS Watch is a place for inspiration, for us to share in the energy of our colleagues. It's a place to see old friends and a place to make new ones and a place to become empowered and strategically exert the influence of hundreds of people living with HIV and their allies. Luckily, none of that changes in 2020. Yes, we're virtual now, but as Andrew noted, technology is a great resource for social change. Over the past several years, we've used the internet and social media 
to change elections and the ways that candidates and campaigns engage with and are held accountable by voters. We've seen social media change the way that foreign uprisings and other political events are covered. And we've urged the internet to build platforms for voices that otherwise would not have been heard. And perhaps most importantly, we experience the internet as a safe place for underserved and stigmatized communities to come together, share information, disseminate resources, and to offer and seek support. There is truly so much potential in the virtual. As some of you noted in the chat earlier, the internet is also allowing people without the means to travel to or attend AIDS Watch to participate virtually. People who are homebound, people who have social anxiety, who could only attend a portion of sessions, or people who were unable to step away from other commitments can now engage with AIDS Watch in a way that works for them. And for the rest of today's sessions, I challenge everyone on this Zoom meeting to harness technology in a way that makes this year's conference even more impactful than in years past. Find ways to connect with people from your state who you might not know or might not remember. Identify concrete requests that you can bring to congressional phone lines, inboxes, and social media accounts. Coordinate with attendees from your state to move in lockstep. One call about a specific bill might not rise to their attention, but 10, 20, 50 calls just might. We are strong enough to surpass whatever technological challenges may face us today. Our strength will allow us to take what we learn today and engage with our elected officials tomorrow or in days to come. As Robert said earlier this morning, for members of Congress who support us, we need to thank them, let them know we're watching, and urge them to do more. For members of Congress who oppose us, we must do what we have done for over 27 years respectfully yet forcefully demand the representation we deserve and explain what sound evidence-based laws look like. This year more than ever, it is essential that we make our voices heard. We must be persistent and call attention to the ways Congress must act to support people living with HIV. Let's unite our voices through the tools available to us calls, emails, Twitter, Facebook, Insta, social media, op-eds, letters, anything that noise and ensures that our voices are heard. We have a couple minutes break coming up, grab some food, stretch your bodies, run outside, breathe in some sunshine if you have it. And then most importantly, come back for the next session titled WTF, a new advocacy orientation. WTF stands for what's this folder or perhaps in the virtual world we should be using what's this file. Join the caucus, NASDAQ, and AIDS United to learn about the policy requests we have and the advocacy tools we can use via the social via social media and the internet. You can join shortly at the link on the landing page. Be well and see everyone soon. I'll be in the chat. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ann. I just wanted to uh, say to folks, as you can see on the screen um, here, that uh, we will start the next session, um, WTF, uh, at the, uh, this, if you go to this address here on the slide, um, you can then um, pick up that Zoom meeting um, link and uh, go straight to this, this uh, conference. So thank you so much. Uh, for supporting AIDS Watch uh, for the morning session. And uh, now we will move directly into uh, the afternoon presentations. And again, you can go to the link that's here on the screen um, and then uh, go into the session that says uh, WTF with the, uh, with the Zoom link uh, next to you. Thank you.